Um, so I just want to give you a flow of how this is going to work. Um, I just want I'll give you an introduction and introduce uh, the speakers and introduce um, why I'm doing this. Um, and then we're going to go into some questions that we've all been talking about as, as a group. And then we will <coughs> give you all time to ask some questions. And then uh, if there's some questions that come from there and, and that we all need to discuss as a group, as opposed to from the panel, um, you, we will we'll do that at that point. Um, the introduction, I'll introduce myself and the panelists, and I will also um, set up some rules of engagement and why we wanted to do this in a different way. So, um, for those of you who might not know why you're in this room, this is the, this is the pathway panel on power, privilege, race, and identity in conservation. At weddings in Kenya, because very many people show up, uh, and, and a lot of people don't even know whose wedding it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's important to <laughs> So with these power dynamics and perceptions of where power lies, how effective is the conservation movement? And how sustainable is the current model? Before we get there, is it even possible to have a productive conversation <coughs> on these issues? Fully acknowledging, but pushing through the discomfort that these topics elicit. This is why we're here today. Um, I am Rasan tied up. I'm the deputy director at an incredible organization called Luas Alliance, and I've got team members in the room who are here to support me and support this. Um, I've worked in conservation for <coughs> about a decade now, and when I first joined, I felt there was something wrong with it. But I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and I couldn't articulate the problem. The people in the organizations that I worked with and interacted with were almost always very nice. <laughs> but even, and even now I stand on the shoulders of so many people of different colors who have believed in me, they have taught me so much and educated me. But as, as James Baldwin says, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which one is. <coughs> I began to formulate questions in my mind of what I felt was wrong. Why does there appear to be a glass ceiling in most conservation organizations? Why are there the, where are the voices of those most affected by wildlife? Who really makes the decisions in community conservation? Can a black person fundraise alone successfully for conservation? Can two people of different colors with the same qualifications earn the same. But these questions remained unspoken. Those who held power as I perceived it might not like the discussion that would ensue, or at least that's what I thought. Yvonne Awar says Kenya's official languages are English, Kiswahili, and silence. <laughs> <laughs> I am grateful for those who broke the silence on this issue. But allow me to break my silence in a different way one that's uncompromising, but extends a hand rather than smacking everybody down. Now I'd like to introduce the incredible <laughs> panelists who are here. Um, I will start with David. <laughs> okay, fine, I'll start, I'll start at the end and then, and then carry on. Um, Colleen Begg is a white African and our main speaker as our main speaker on identity in the conservation space. She is one of, if not the most nuanced speaker I've ever met. 
giving voice to complexities most of the world would be unable to articulate comfortably, yet she does it with such empathy and ease. She's also our only completely field-based panelist um, and can talk us through that life of, in the, uh, of, of living in the bush for the past 18 years. Um, officially, Dr. Colleen Begg is a well-published scientist and co-founder of the Yasa Carnivore Project in Mozambique. Please welcome our panel. We're kind of on the on the nuanced thing. So David is our main participant, based for a long time in the Meru Lakepia region, which I consider to be the seat of constructive oblivion in Kenya. Um, <laughs> this is a term that was was coined by um, Kasmira will remind me the name of the author, um, and it basically is talks about how it's not just about the silence on racism; it's about all the things that have been constructed to not talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, David takes a, a Martin Luther King approach to discussing these issues. He's the king of nuance, that's why I'm saying that we're like, <laughs> that's, that's the nuance corner. <laughs> Considering himself to be a peacemaker. Uh, officially, Dr. David Kimiti is a, is a Kenya range land ecologist, currently working as the head of research uh, and monitoring for the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy in Northern Kenya. Manione Kaunga is among those who've worked actively for the rights of in indigenous people in the conservation sphere. Very few and uh, in the conservation sphere, um, and for as long as I've known him and followed his work, he has been a nose to the grind person, not necessarily making a fuss <coughs> of his, the great strides that he's made in this sphere, but always making strides. Um, and his human rights, he, his human rights takes, <coughs> it needs to, it's, it's really a great discussion point, especially on the militarization of conservation, which we will talk about. Um, officially, Mali Olekaunga is a founder and director of IMPACT, which is the Indigenous Movement for Peace and Advancement, and for, for Peace Advancement and Conflict Transformation, an organization that exists to organize, build, and strengthen indigenous peoples, <coughs> social <coughs> movements at a grassroots level in the UK. who is represented the embedded immigrant slash expat, uh, people whose lives are and probably forever will be intertwined with conservation in African countries. Kasmira is to me the most conscious and self-aware person I've ever met when it comes to issues of place, belonging, privilege in the conservation world, and actually has helped me develop from a very black and white perspective to have a lot of color. <laughs> complex, it's, it's now a much more complex view, at least as far as I view, um, while still keeping the clarity of purpose. Officially, Kasmira Cockerell is a portfolio manager who leads and facilitates organizational development, development support to Malia City Partners, a network of high-performing conservation organizations. to announce when places are safe spaces. I, I think that somebody needs to define them because I, I, I'm worried that everybody who starts a session says this is a safe space. <laughs> but this is really a safe space to express people's opinions. And this comes with a caveat. These issues have almost always been historically talked about with a very angry and finger pointing vitriolic fashion. Um, we want to try and have this a healthier conversation, recognizing that everybody in the room is on a different stage of the continuum of understanding these issues. So our key words are empathy and courage. So have the courage to speak up, but also have the empathy to understand that the person next to you might not be ready. Um, we live in a plural world where multiple points of view can exist simultaneously and not be wrong. So our panelists won't always agree. This is healthy. Um, but there will be personal attacks. 
I don't know if David would like to say at this point um, the nuance thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> I think maybe one of the things that's being picked up is um, a tenet I usually use is um, Albert Maisel said, the tyranny is the deliberate removal of nuance. Um, sorry if someone fall as I was saying that. <laughs> tyranny is falling. I need to shock you too much. Uh, but yeah, tyranny is the deliberate removal of nuance, and uh, it is possible to have a, a conversation that acknowledges all sides without uh, necessarily uh, demonizing one or the other. But at the same time, it is also important to speak truth, um, uh, avoid innuendo as much as possible, facts, figures, uh, opinions are welcome, but hopefully they are uh, well thought out and not targeted at um, pushing people down, or rather raising the level of conversation. So, uh, that's the um, I really wanted to get diverse opinions from Africa. Um, I have not managed to do so with my panel because three of them have mostly a Kenyan perspective and one has a Mozambican perspective. But I hope that what we have not managed to do in the panel, we have managed to do in this room, which I'm really, really excited about, that we will have a diverse um, discussion, which I think will be really rich. Um, and our panelists, while they, may while they may belong to certain groupings, they will not represent those groupings. Colleen will not be speaking on behalf of all white Africans in Africa. She <laughs> 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 just be speaking as Colleen and her experiences and what she has learned. So, yes. Um, and although I'm the moderator, I, I, I would please like your permission to chime in once in a while with some of my opinionated mess. <laughs> um, it's taken great courage for these panelists to be here. Please be mindful of that and inform me your, your questions. Um, and nobody is here to give us panaceas or silver bullets. We're here to just have a discussion and provide some ideas, and hopefully ideas will also come from this side of the room. That's it. I'm <laughs> being the rules. <laughs> okay. Um, great. with talking about privilege. And a lot of the time we don't really think of what privilege is, we just think of the things that we've been wronged about, mm -hmm. and, and that those people had privilege. So I'd like to ask just a few questions. Um, I hope you'll be called Mr. <laughs> 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 yes. Please raise your hand if you completed high school. Okay, raise another hand. No, okay, keep that hand up. Okay. Sorry, I was not clear. Um, and raise your hand if you were able to pay for your tertiary education or if you had parents who were able to do so for you. Another hand. Other hand. Make fists. What is that? Uh, did did somebody pay for your university education? Yes. Yourself? Yes. Yes. Like, like you didn't. Yes. Maybe you didn't get a scholarship, or the government didn't pay for you. I'm talking about like your parents did it, or you struggled and you paid for yourself somehow. Okay, so, so yes, hands up. Okay, uh, make fists, please. Um, put one finger up if one or more of your parents are educated. Put another finger up if you've been able to travel abroad. Some of you are here, so. <laughs> education most of your childhood. I mean, if you had electricity, sorry, most of your childhood. Yeah. Electricity in your house. Put another one up if you never had to worry about what your next meal was. Okay. Look around with your hands up. You, there's some people who have all their hands and fingers and everything. And some, people, some people have a few. 
So there's some privilege with the market mm -hmm. So there are some privileges that we all have that we take for granted. I think I saw that in the panel that, that, that was up there uh, this morning and they were talking about their parents and people who pushed them and people who allowed them to say things in a room. Not everybody had those opportunities and were able to form their voices from a, from a young age. Those are all, as much as they are small things and we're really trying to make them human rights, but they are still privilege. So as we talk about privilege, we should be mindful of these things. Yeah? Okay. So I would like um, to start by asking Colleen um, what white privilege is, how it shows up, um, and maybe just speak a bit about it in your own context, and then we can sure. get more views. Can you all hear us? Yes. yes. So, so just a little bit of background. I work in Mozambique and have for the last 18 years. I'm South African, and I grew up during apartheid. And it's really important to mention that because that defines the generation that I am. And South Africa is all about race still. So while I work in Mozambique, I'm very aware of, of the privilege that I've had and the consequences of the privilege that I've had. I think that um, one of the interesting things about this panel is that you have to, um, it's important to, it's important to talk about white privilege, but uh, a white person is not the right person to talk about it, but that black people or people of color are scared to talk about it because they always get shut down. So when the son asked me, do I, would I be prepared to talk about it? Absolutely. So I see it all the time, but I know that as a white person, I'm probably oblivious to 70% of it. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak to exactly what it looks like for someone of color. I can only tell you that I do observe it, and that I believe that when I observe it, it makes me racist um, and complicit if I allow it. Mm -hmm. Um, even if I don't do it myself, but that I miss a lot of it. So for example, just before I came here, I actually asked our management team, who are some not here, but um, who are all, so our entire team is mostly. I asked them, I had some of my <coughs> examples, but, but what it looks like in the first <coughs> space. So for example, um, there are only two white um, people in our company, my husband and I, who founded the project. And when our managers go to a meeting called by the government <coughs> for managers, all the other managers are white. And our managers are Mozambican, and they're always asked, where are the white people who can make the decision? <coughs> white privilege. When we go fundraising, it is a lot easier for me to raise money because our donors come from the US, and they identify with me, and they live through me. And so that identification makes them give me money because they're amazed that I'm living in the bush and raising my two children in there. But they don't have the same identification with our staff. And so I have no idea how I'm gonna hand over the fundraising. It's clearly there. And I'm being very honest with you. I can see it and I know there are lots of other small things that happen. Um, and so I think the conservation space has to acknowledge that white privilege exists. I have um, almost all the things I had on my fingers up, except that I'm completely educated in Africa. Um, so uh, I don't, I wasn't educated anywhere else. I was educated in Zimbabwe, I was South Africa. So I think I hope I open the conversation now so that all the people who do experience it on a daily basis now feel confident that they can express it because it's there and it's a thing, and we need to acknowledge it, and we need to deal with it. Um, anyone else want to say something on this topic? As the one of the other black panelists, I think it's, uh, it's not my, my <laughs> duty. Duty. It's not my duty. <laughs> um, but I think that the, the Questions of privilege, like Colin is saying, always bring up issues of, and it's not just in conservation. Let's you know, let's get that um, yeah. out there. It's not just in conservation; it's in multiple industries. And 
even you know, I, I studied in the U.S. and even while there, I could, it was still something I was experiencing and uh, sort of looking through. But I think in conservation, especially, the biggest manifestation, if you will, of my privilege that I've found, and you know, most of my friends that I've talked to this about know how how much this hurts me is um, the the differing levels of competency attached to the different races. So, for example. For me to do my job, I need to be uh, very competent, very well educated, you know, uh, black person. For a black person, I need to be very competent, very well educated. Very articulate. Very. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You speak English very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fault I, I, I acquired accidentally. <laughs> but but that, that feeling that I needed, I'm, I was always constantly trying to think, you know, I, I need not to screw this up. Mm -hmm. Because if, if I screw this up, they might not give another black person this mm -hmm. opportunity again. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the, on the other side, I've been in a lot of places where people that would either be working at the same level at, or in some, some cases would be um, supervising <coughs> me, would not need the same level of competence. Mm -hmm. But somehow it's as if they were given a bit more leeway to find themselves mm -hmm. on the job. A leeway which the black people in the same position or not given. And so that I think was my first real sort of, yeah, collision with uh, privilege when once that realization started coming up, when you're asking someone at a, you know, a management meeting with what, you know, where did you go to school, where did you study? And they're like, oh, and I, you know, I raised cattle in a farm, you know, somewhere. And you'd be like, huh, okay, that's a, I feel slightly cheated with my PhD and <laughs> <laughs> the mental anguish that came with it. So it was just sort of, <laughs> that sort of level is where I sort of came into you know, the conversation with Yeah, I, I think uh, it's very interesting. In, in 1995, uh, I, pioneered, I founded another organization, my first organization called Osiligi. Uh, which was became very powerful. It was later banned by the government. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so it happened that uh, the Danish Volunteer Service uh, posted uh, uh, an advisor to this organization. And another, another Danish organization offered to buy a car. So we went to ESO, not far off from most people from Nanyuki, so to buy a car. So I was there and uh, Maria Kempe from uh, the volunteer was there. So mm -hmm. I was talking and the guy couldn't listen to me. Yeah. And the director, she's an advisor, she's mm -hmm. white. So I was asked to stop, uh, just wait a little bit uh, as, as we have negotiated. And then uh, I took that very se seriously. And I told, uh, we are actually at the quarrel. If you know, uh, if, if people know uh, the guy from so you know how quarrelsome he is. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I, and we had, I, I stopped buying the car, I, I went to directly to Toyota. <laughs> and, but it was an issue uh, that uh, I experienced on a daily basis. Yeah, mm. so. So, something that I have struggled <coughs> with around privilege is that the burden of proof for most white people to realize that they have privilege is for someone who's not white to tell them. And I feel very lucky to have people in my life that have been, you know, very open, very honest, very direct with me since I was very young, you know. So I, I've had a lot more space in conversations with people who don't look like me. But those same people will tell me that it's not their job to educate white people on how to be better people, right? <laughs> and that's, right, like, we don't really talk about, like, how you come to these realizations, right? And how you continue to educate yourself. And white privilege is this word that's thrown around that can be really problematic and we don't define it. I really appreciate this one taking the time for us to have a little bit of experience with what that word really means. But I challenge everyone, right? And it's not just a race thing, privilege comes from many dynamics, but to do that work, right? It's like, it's not on the burden of others around you to do that work for you. And then to be humble about being wrong, right? And like making mistakes and saying things that are maybe just not okay. And to be like, 
and to apologize, right? Like genuinely and, and to figure out a path forward. And I think that that practice, and it is a practice, it is something that we all kind of suck at the first time we do it, um, you know, it gets easier and it creates more space for a lot more honesty. Um, but I think it starts with recognizing that that responsibility, that burden, like isn't on other people around you, right? It, it's really on ourselves as individuals to step into that awkwardness and that uncomfortableness. I mean, just to add, I think that um, there are many leaders in this room. Mm -hmm. And so I think that while um, we need to create the space in our organizations that everybody feels comfortable when it happens that they can bring it up, if yeah. you haven't noticed. Yeah. Because um, while I, I agree with you that the, the burden of proof is not on other people to point it out, I think that sometimes we're clueless. Um, oh, because some yeah. of it is quite subtle and we're so used to our position of privilege that we don't notice it as often as we should. Mm -hmm. And so we have to create these spaces where our staff and our teams um, can say to us, actually that made me feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. Or that occasion when I was with you in that situation, I was feeling very uncomfortable that because this happened. Mm -hmm. Because that's the way we grow as leaders and that is our responsibility is to create these diverse and inclusive teams. And, and we have to, as you say, keep learning and, and keep figuring it out. But if there's no safe space in your organization, and the mm -hmm. person at the top, who in many conservation organizations is white, yeah. won't allow those conversations to happen, then, then there's no way for anyone to express how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That really great. Mm -hmm. I think I just want to take the temperature of the room with a couple of questions. Um, on just this topic, um, because it's, it's, it's kind of theoretical until we kind of think about the, the human cost of this thing. Um, raise your hand if you've ever experienced some level, if you're comfortable, some level of inequality brought about by race in the conservation world. Clap once if at some point in your career, you have seen racial inequality play out, maybe in a small way, in the workplace. Clap twice if you've seen it play out in like a much bigger way. Clap three times if some experience with inequality has influenced you so powerfully, or you carry around, you carry it around every day. There is a huge human cost, and I think sometimes people don't really recognize that these are things that, that really actually hurt people, um, and they, they change how we do what we should be doing, the way that we are doing it. Um, we were talking with David uh, the other day, and he wrote up these two different terms. He said, I think that that race thing was circumstantial. <laughs> it wasn't structural. <laughs> and I really wanted <laughs> to to talk about what he said when when I asked when I asked like what what explain that. So yes. I really should think things through because <laughs> <laughs> Well I think so so first like you know, like Russell is saying that that was a spot of the moment thing because I, I was struggling to really encapsulate what exactly my, my, my thought process was. And we were having a discussion about, you know, uh, I worked at this research center and I was asking, you know, she was asking me if I thought the research center was was a racist place in and of itself. And I, I was sort of thinking about it and realizing it w wasn't necessarily that. And I know we talk about, you know, intersectionality and all these other things that are very often buzzwords. But in this particular case, what I was trying to put voice to was the, the fact that the fact that the people in the research center were not racially diverse wasn't a result of any structures that the research center itself had set up to keep people of color away. It was just the background structures that existed in the places. For you know, using my my my, my case for example, it was you know maybe it's the fact that Kenyan universities don't really have good funding when it comes to sending students to the field. You know, any, any Kenyan student here, any person here that has gone through a Kenyan university knows how difficult it is to get any funding for field work from a Kenyan university. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, American students that I was, you know, in the same place with had access to the 
you know, National Science Foundation graduate, um, something like graduate development grant or something like that. Most of them had NSF grants that allowed them to come to this to this research center. I was only there because I got a scholarship because I bothered someone sufficiently enough for them to, uh, you know, decide to help pay for the rest of my stay there. But my university did not have money to send me there. So if you sort of look at it in that sense, in the sense that it wasn't necessarily that the place itself was racist, but the, the structures that led to people getting there. But I think my point after that was that even places like that have a responsibility to work towards solving that problem. You know, whether it's improving access to scholarships for African students, whether it's lobbying in terms of policy for um, you know, bodies like the National uh, Council for Science and Technology mm -hmm. to actually have a role within that organization that gives meaningful grants to Kenyan students, not 2,000 shillings or 5,000 shillings, but money that can actually fund research. Because otherwise, in most of those places, you find you have a lot of African students that are very interested in going to the field and studying, but without access to the funding to allow them to do that, they're never, it's never going to be them. They have to work as a field assistant for somebody or um, sort of lobby someone to get a master's you know, position in someone else's PhD project so they can share those resources and sort of piggyback off of that. And that, that is what I meant that it wasn't necessarily structural in the sense that someone had set up these blocks and barriers on purpose to keep people of color down is that the circumstances in which we found ourselves in meant that it was more likely for uh, you know, people of, and not necessarily white, but also just foreign uh, uh, you know, students in places where they actually get grants um, to get that. I was struggling to find a means to get around and a Swedish friend of mine got a grant from the EU for, um, I think it was $20,000 to buy a car. And so it was just that sort of, you know, she wasn't being racist by getting the car, and the EU wasn't being racist for giving her the car, but it was definitely, if you go back to, to sort of the, the issues of structural um, inequality when it comes to economics and all of that, that's where the problem was beginning. It wasn't necessarily that the situation I was in was in and of itself racist. Mm -hmm. so. And this conference is a really good example of that because we had to be very um, intentional about our, you know, we had the theme, open the do door to diverse voices, and then the amount of money you had to pay was $500 to come here. So we had to be very intentional about where we had it so people could afford the, the accommodation and wasn't gonna add a whole lot more on, and provide 70 scholarships so people could come here, because otherwise the audience would have looked very different, mm -hmm. because we would have, we would have created this opportunity for, for a lot of, of, of students who had the means to come here, but, but then excluded everybody else. So I think that's a really good point, which I hadn't, um, I know you said it sort of off the cuff in the conversation, yeah. but it, it started a whole conversation in my family because my mm -hmm. husband was also listening to the conversation. We had a whole discussion about mm -hmm. it, and I think it's a very important distinction. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's right, it just, it's just yeah. it's different. And the solutions for that are, in a way, more, they're different, they're more subtle than the solutions yeah. for, you know, structural racism. And it's, it's a bit more in-depth in terms of mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, the, the problems that lead to that uh, in, with regards to economics and uh, inequality and access to Yeah, I mean, I actually just want to politely disagree slightly in the sense that if we, at the beginning of this, when we did the privilege game, there was a lot of privilege in this room. Right? There are very few people who had less than four fingers up. And so as much as I think this conference has done amazing things and I don't want to undermine that, there's still a structural problem with conferences as a way to bring together the right people to discuss, make decisions, raise money, all the things that happen here, right? So like I applaud immensely the effort that's been made and you can see it, 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 it we can feel it right we're having this conversation right yeah, but there is still other layers there that i think is also the reason we're having this conversation mm -hmm. yeah. it's a process and i think mm. that we, we just have to be very mindful of it always yeah um on the front, i want to ask you um if we can uh, we're going to shift a little to talk about power and power, this power might not be necessarily racially linked. Um, you explained in the past that sometimes moving away from traditional structures when you're talking about communities and community uh, in conservation, um, 
that affects their conservation work. You said that it, it causes, sometimes it causes communities to lose their voice rather than having a voice. Um, what are these new structures? How does that happen? What is that power play? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I think uh, we are operating in a landscape where there are a number of uh, organizations and institutions that are playing different roles. And I think, uh, for me, I always look into the communities uh, where all these dynamics are happening. And uh, I look into uh, language, language and uh, traditional setups are very powerful <coughs> avenues for influencing community to communicate and influence uh, decisions and when you and most of us uh, if we had gone to school learn in our own traditional languages mother tongues I think we will have been much more the assessment will have been much more different mm -hmm. uh, so I think for, for me language is very important as an entry point of, uh, mm, for empowerment or disempowerment uh, so is uh, also the whole setup of his governance whether it's natural resource governance or issue decision making. And we're looking into a number of pastoral setups. They are, they are uh, um, traditional institutions of governance and decision making that have existed over time. So the modern way of cons uh, conservation or the hybrid of it uh, is shifting from using traditional to either using hybrid or totally new structures. Mm -hmm. The whole issue about, um, and I can tell you uh, for uh, uh, a number of examples. Uh, uh, traditionally, communities will meet, elders will meet, there was some way, a mechanism uh, for them to meet and discuss about their own landscapes, their issues. Right now, uh, they, dis they meet as committees, a, a conservation committee, a water committee. So certain fragmentations are happening, consciously or unconsciously. And this, for me, is distorts communities from really thinking as a community. You start uh, compartmentalizing communities to a, a level where as, uh, and you create levels and structures of decision making that necessarily do not empower the community. And if I uh, give you, I've been in a number of uh, areas in Samburu when uh, elections are held for group branches, you will be amazed the level of power, uh, money being used for you to get that, uh, uh, to, to attain one of the uh, decisions, especially for women. You have to have money to get that. Why? It's because these new structures come with costs. And it's, it has no difference actually with the Kenyan way of doing politics. You have to have money to, you have to, have money to, uh, to, uh, to gain leadership. That's what's happening and it will continue, continue to happen. So you are dealing, you are creating, uh, you are creating new position, new governance structures that require money to sustain. Uh, the traditional <coughs> institutional governance are created through uh, the interaction with their own landscapes and all that, uh, and they don't require any money. Nobody, uh, and looking into a number of organizations, they have a council of elders, and uh, you'll, you'll see the people in that council of elders, and you wonder, when did they become an elder? <laughs> see? So the, some of these things for me are very important in that um, eventually you, are, you, you, you you kind of profile communities to a level that we, we definitely know who will be, who will be uh, the chairman of that group and of that community. So, and then you, you, we end up saying these are community based. Mm -hmm. you, you frame it in a way it's community, see? Yeah. Uh, but actually, it, it, you have actually created a structure that uh, fragments that community further. So for me, that is very important. Looking into, I don't know exactly, uh, 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 how the boards of a number of organizations are, uh, uh, are organized. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you look in a number of organizations uh, dealing with conservation, uh, they got probably the who is who in, uh, in their boards. Mm -hmm. See? Uh, so if you come to an organization like Impact, which has very rural people on their boards, uh, then they don't create another space for you to be able to fundraise, uh, you are actually uh, not uh, um, playing to the game uh, as it should be. So these are some of the uh, we, we, uh, we are, uh, we, uh, I see it myself. I'm not to say it's right or wrong, but I also I see a number of uh, dynamics within uh, uh, organizations that are leading conservation in one way or the other. And of course, right now we need to actually talk a lot. We are involved in a number of uh, uh, processes that are trying to, to move away from conservation.
it's actually the, the, you have been to spaces where you talk about conservation, the game is dead, the discussions, dialogue is, 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 mm -hmm. is done. So we are talking about our legal like guardianship, I mean, stewardship, natural resources, all these issues. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, there are a number of, I know a number of organizations uh, um, that uh, they are trying to more or less uh, um, indigenize by having more and more black people, but uh, uh, black people after the management. But uh, uh, the question of decision making and power is still somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you see, and this is uh, you, you present you present that kind of uh, way as oh we are we are building capacity all this. But uh, anyway, of course you are. Uh, uh, but in what sense? If you look into the internal issue about um, assessing organisations and how leadership is constructed in those organisations, you will see typically you will see uh, something different. So all these things are, these are happening for the good, but I, I, uh, but I, uh, somebody asked me a few, um, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, when, uh, how old is your organization? I told me about, this, uh, about uh, uh, 20, I've been displaced myself for about 20, 26 years, but the, uh, the new organization after the other one was banned, is about, uh, is about 20 years. Oh my goodness, and you have not scaled up. You look at this, that organization uh, is about only five years and uh, they, they are all over. You see, uh, you, you mean you are, your staff are not that at all? So I, it, it, it helped me to really dig deeper into what am I doing wrong. So I just, uh, I just looked into it and then I, oh yeah, I think I understand what you're talking about. Uh, I can't afford to have a white person in the organization. <laughs> <laughs> And so this is for, for Kasmira, if you can explain in your experience and in what you've seen how funding and funding sources drive inequality in conservation. Yeah, thanks, Hassan. I think we've touched a little bit on it already in this panel and even in the morning mm -hmm. session. There are some mm -hmm. great anecdotes from those lovely women. Um, but maybe I might just borrow committee's framework of this sort of structural and circumstantial <laughs> sort of issues, right? And, you know, structurally, I think we have a big problem in fundraising because the money comes from one place in the world and goes to another place in the world, right? It comes from the West, it comes from predominantly Western cultures, and it comes into the South, you know, Asia, Africa, we're talking about. And that's pretty much the truth, right? That's obvious, <laughs> but also that that is the beginning of the problem, right? And, you know, we we're talking about power on this panel, and I think we give money a lot of power, right? And, you know, I think that we are coming from a history where those relationships are transactional. I have this money, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to go buy someone to do that, right? Funders are, are buyers, right? <coughs> However, I would like to suggest that we're in a time of transition. I would say it's a pretty big time. I would say it's like we're in a generation or two of transition. But I do think that there has been a lot of intent on both sides of the equation, the funders and those being funded, to change from this very transactional relationship into a much more re relational one. Now this doesn't solve the structural problem, but it may solve some of the consequential ones, right? So if you can have stronger and more loud organizations with, who, uh, with Kenyans or Africans or black people at their head, right? They can start to change those relationships on a relational basis, right? And then structurally, like, where is the African money in, all in conservation, mm -hmm. right? Where are the Kenyan corporates in their funding right now? I, mean, I think it's a big question that we have to, you know, look and ask of ourselves, right? And I think that you know, I think uh, this history, right, that both of you have spoken to around the fact that you need a white person to fundraise for you. That is, at the moment, pretty much a given in the industry, right? And it is an industry, let's not kid ourselves, right? This is transactional, money is shaking hands, people are taking percentages, you know, it's a business, um, even if the business is meant to be nonprofit. Um, but how do, we, well, how do we change that, right? Like, I think that's the more interesting question. I think we all have experienced the problem. I think we've all seen it. Um, and I think that those organizations that are doing well need to push the envelope for all the other organizations coming along, right? 
leaders need to step back and send people to their fundraising events, right? There needs to be more succession planning in conservation. You know, leaders need to be ready to step down and have the next generation join, lead, and do things differently. And that's going to be okay, right? As long as it's authentic, as long as it's true to what you know the real purpose and you know impact of that organization <coughs> is. I believe that change is, is possible in some of this space. Um, yeah. I, I think that one of the complications with fundraising, so almost all our funding comes from individual donors, not grants. Mm. And one of the real problems I have with it is that it's hero-based. Yeah. Mm. And the hero happens to be the first person who goes, which inevitably, at the state that conservation is at the moment, when you start an organization, lots of conservation organizations, end up being the white person. Okay. And even when you have a succession plan that is going to push everybody through, you still fixated on that one hero that they have. And they make all these assumptions that if you don't go, then the money's not going to go. So one of the ways I think we solve this is convincing everybody, and it doesn't mean convincing because it's the truth, hmm. is that conservation is not research. Research is individual based. Conservation is team based. And so when you have a conservation project, we have a team. We don't have a single individual. Because I think that a lot of these donors have uh, transitioned from supporting research. And if you look at some of the funding proposals, like who is the principal investigator for a funding proposal for a conservation organization? Conservation doesn't have a principal investigator. It has a team of people that go out there and do the work. So I think that's one of the one of the answers to it. And the other, again, is sort of goes back to my white privilege thing, is that I think we have more power than we think we do with donors. I think when you push back and you say, actually, this is not acceptable, <coughs> and I am sending my team, and this is who you're going to, and what's nice is a great example of that, is that, and this is, who, this is who we are, and you're not going to get the same person every time coming because it's too exhausting and it's too disruptive, but we are a team, we are solid, we are stable, and, and then we start to push the input. But we have to educate. We mm -hmm. can't just sit back and think we have to take the money back. Exactly. Just, uh, so just two quick things. One of the, I was doing some research earlier, and uh, another industry that suffers a lot from this is the, the, the whole startup industry in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And I think we were, Village Capital had this you know, quick research they did where they found that 90%, more than 90% of East Africa startups are um, the funding that went to East Africa startups went to those startups with expert uh, founders. Mm -hmm. and so it's obviously not an issue that is unique to conservation. It has to be it's something more mm -hmm. yeah, uh, systemic, systemic and global in the sense of this, again, comes back to the, to, to the sense of trust given to um, organizations that have some sort of, if, if you're an organization that is Kenyan-led and black people that you need to sh have shown like a good track record of having achieved stuff, whereas it, it's not necessarily the case on the other, on the other side. Um, and yeah, also what, what you're talking about in terms of funding, I think, so my background is in the, from the research world. Mm -hmm. I, I, came through con I, I came into conservation tangentially from um, biological research, and I remember you know, when I first joined my organization, Leo was one of, I, I won't be in July as a scientist, one of the attractants was like, oh yeah, these guys, I hear they get a lot of funding, so I'll probably have a lot of funding for all the research I want to do. Mm -hmm. But then once I got there, and you know, I'm the head of, you know, the research department, and I'm looking for funding, I'm like, yeah, so guys, we need to study soils, we need to study grasses, we need to study water, let's go out there and look for funding for this. And it's taken me two years to get one grant for hydrology. I haven't not yet gotten any grants for, for, for rainland ecology or soils and grasses. But I feel like every other week someone's offering me money to study rhinos or rhinos. <laughs> or, uh, and that's another, that's another thing. And if we hadn't started pushing back, not just to the, the people doing the, the funding, but also the people doing the fundraising, that these are our priorities, actually. This is, I don't care that you have you know, twenty thousand dollars for for you know lions, and someone else is giving the same. I need even just five thousand dollars for studying water and studying soil. And so, often it's it's also a question of what, how can we make those, you know, things that are more um, relevant to us as like, conservation organizations also relevant to 
to everyone else? Is it a marketing issue? Are we not communicating you know, correctly that these are the actual issues? What is it that we have, what step are we missing? And I think that's sort of the challenge I've been trying to struggle with is what's missing in that, why is that disconnect? Why is there that disconnect between the people wanting to give the money and the people doing the work in the field? Yeah, and uh, still coming to communities and uh, my problem uh, on this. I think uh, for conservation based on, I mean, uh, organization to do stuff that actually a mandate of the government. For instance, water, services, that are, you see, you actually blinding those communities from claiming their rights from their governments. So that, that's my argument. Y so you actually weaken that community from advancing their own rights of, their s they pay taxes. They pay all these uh, other things. So by providing water, so where is where is their where is the, uh, where is the, uh, where is their claim from government, either county or national? You see, they will sit and wait because so and so will do it, and this is happening. Mm -hmm. You realize that in areas in areas where conservation initiatives are going on, a community don't want to talk about rights. Because someone else is doing that. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hold their leaders accountable. So when you say, where is African money for conservation? Uh, uh, I will tell you, even K uh, K Kenya Wildlife Service is shockingly broke. Mm -hmm. So how do you expect a, a, a Kenya Wildlife Service to regulate? Uh, a, a conservation is about power. It's about power from the dollar and polit polit uh, political linkages. So uh, if, if, uh, if these organizations have more money than KWS, and KWS is supposed to regulate them, how does that happen? Well, of course, I know the structure in which the, the KWS board is, uh, they have uh, Kenya Wildlife Services, I mean, I mean uh, conservancy uh, represented. But uh, you can't really expect due diligence in an organization like that where you are, you are in both. You are in the board of that organization. Um, uh, you are also supposed to be regulating yourself on the ground. So in such spaces, um, it becomes a little bit very, very difficult uh, for, for institutional strengthening for even the government to perform its functions. And th this is actually, yeah, I, I always meet um, uh, some of these guys from Kenya Wildlife Service and they say, we no longer have money. So uh, I think it's good, but do we really identify spaces that are getting weakened by strengthened, I mean, a lot of focus on, you see? And uh, you, you, you all know this when we had have, we have David Western leading, uh, the reason why David Western was brought into Kenya Wildlife Service, you know why Leaky was brought up, what happened? You see, there was huge funding for Kenya Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, uh, they had a highly motivated uh, uh, staff. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? I think let's be frank about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and let's so be frank, the yeah? KWS was designed for a white person to fundraise for them, right? It's, it's, it's a peristatal for a reason. It's a peristatal because there was going to be these particular figureheads to go out and get that money, you know? So yeah, yeah, so uh, uh, certainly I think uh, probably <coughs> then we need to, uh, to, to, to bring that person back. <laughs> <laughs> The dream team. We call it the dream team. Okay. The dream team. We call it the dream team. Yeah. Okay, so I have a whole lot more questions to ask, and we still have a bit of time. But before um, I get to them, I wanted to know from the room, just for maybe three people, you came here expecting something. If, if some people got brave enough to share some of their expectations, maybe some of them have already been met, but Maybe something that, you know, it's there and you really want to say it or talk about it or you're wondering if it might come up. Um, or maybe something personal that, 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 is, that has driven you to, to be here. One, two. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take three right at the back. Okay, so yes. 
Uh, uh, for me, I, I think something we should talk about in line with the fundraising issue has to do with, like, don't get mad at me, how <laughs> black people manage money and what happens when we get money. Okay, so <laughs> in my country, I'll give an example that's not related to conservation, but like the construction and manufacturing industry. So we have the Chinese <coughs> contractors and the local contractors, mm -hmm. and we're all about giving money to local contractors. But the moment they get the money, boom, big cap, and the contract and the project never gets finished. It's the same here. Conservation, I think, donors have had experiences where they've given money to people, <coughs> can you do this, and it never gets done. And so it, I, I think what happens is they never forget the memory is very long, and they actually <laughs> <laughs> a lot that we have to do to somehow gain that trust back. So I hope um, we touch on that a little bit at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I also want to just make it clear that um, we, we <coughs> may or may not get to that question, um, but at least it, it's come out, and really this is the start of a conversation, and it's something that I really would love to continue to have diverse rooms with these sorts of discussions that we can just have. Mm -hmm. We don't have to hide or to be worried about what the wrong thing is. Yes. Yeah, so for me, uh, my name is John Kabu. Um, I think the, the question again that we want to ask that then will go whether it's to the funders or you know, to the promoters of conservation. If we continue with this trajectory where we have these differences, is there a cost for conservation? Is there a negative cost for conservation? Because I think when we start to see it from the cost implication of, of having this divide, to conservation, then we must know that the future is not good. Yeah, so if we continue to put dollars and everything into uh, conservation uh, ideology, uh, that might not be sustainable in the future. I mean, the case that Kaunga was bringing of uh, for KWS wasn't really Kasinga structured so that then there is a white pay, not necessarily, but during those transitions, we realized that with a white face in KWS, for sure, all their funding baskets open. <laughs> when they were not there, they closed. So, you know, and what, what is becoming of KWS now, if, if, if you have an institution of that magnitude that then cannot regulate conservation, but yet we want to con con continue to promote conservation. So the question of the cost of this divide for conservation going into the future. I mean, I, I will also you know, add to that, that some, some of the challenges that we have in promoting conservation in some of the communities is because they, people have this um, um, mindset that if you're talking about conservation, it's about allowing for space for the white people. Basically, you go out and say, I'm talking about conservation, and they say, where are the white people? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it's impacting negatively to conservation because the spaces that we have, the landowners and everybody, are not necessarily white. And we want everybody to conserve, but if it is only seen in a certain uh, uh, lens, then it is impacting negatively in you know, the ability for us to continue to champion an open space for conservation. Mm -hmm. Right at the back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, my name is Chira. Um, I just wanted to add one more step to the thinking that we were doing about privileges. Um, I mean, we're all very privileged people in this room, but you can also look at it through a positive lens, is how can I use my privilege to make a difference? Um, and I, I mean, I personally I can be aware of different privileges, being white, being a, being a woman, being educated, being a mom, but what can I do with that specific privilege? How can I use it? Um, so I would like to take that back to the room for you to think about that. If you want, can I can I just say something? I'm just because of on the fundraising aspect and the disconnect between indigenous, you know, black Kenyans and conservation, and uh, especially fundraising. You ask where the money is coming from, and uh, you know, as an organization, we've also been asking that for a long time because most of our funding is is foreign funding, and starting to ask ourselves why don't we get more funding from you know local organizations. Are they giving someone else, which is, in which case that's okay, but then the realization that actually no, a lot of 
Kenyan you know, companies and institutions don't give to, uh, and I, it mystified me for a bit, but then I remembered actually Kamanga's um, question has reminded me of the time <coughs> I, I actually was invited to a fundraiser by Sorado, which is this you know, Southern, you know, Southern Rangeland, really great organization, and I was sure it was like a cause, like you know, my friends could get behind, a lot of Kenyans would get behind. I spent so much time on Facebook, you know, trying to sell it and telling people to show up. And then I think we showed up, and I think among we were maybe three black people there, mm -hmm. and most of the other people that had shown up for the fundraising were white people. And then at that point, if you're the community that's being fundraised for, <laughs> then your mind automatically start thinking, well, I guess white people are the yeah. ones that care about, yeah. you know, concept. And so it's sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot when we are trying to have this conversation. So that's just a lesson I remembered that mm -hmm. I thought it might be interesting <laughs> to share. Okay. Um, do you want to respond to any of those before we move forward? Yeah. I think that just to um, speak to Sadiwe's point, um, and, and some of the others as well, I think there's a, a gross lack of transparency in conservation funding. So I don't think it's so much of an issue that people are afraid to give to black person, although I think that is part of the problem. I think that a lot of the funding that's coming is, is being misused. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what we can, and particularly with the really big NGOs, um, because I think there's a lack of accountability and a lack of transparency. And if there's one thing that we could do that would help that problem, but would help the other problem we have with all these millions we spend for very little effect, is that we need proper transparency on how that money is being used. And not a different, um, I guess this is a little bit specific, but one of the things that really bothers me is when people send a report to one donor of a portion of the funding, and then a report to another donor of another portion of the funding. We need complete financial reports for what the organization is getting and where that money is being spent. Mm -hmm. And so that it is completely transparent on all levels. And that would get rid, and that is an organizational need. Um, so all of us who run teams or run organizations need to make sure that our financial reporting, you know, um, just as an example, businesses put their financial reports on the computer. How many conservation organizations put their proper financial reporting with full transparency <coughs> onto the internet so that everybody is able to see them? They, they're not all required to do that. And if they do do it, they do it in such a sort of summarized way that you actually can't tell where the money's going. So I think that's an issue for conservation funding across the board that would help give confidence to donors that it doesn't matter what kind of a person is, it matters whether the organization is structurally transparent and, and doing the right and running a proper business. Well, and I'd go one step further yeah. Yeah. to say, what are you achieving yeah. with exactly. that money? Exactly. What are your, and what are your outcomes, yeah. not just your ticking of the boxes for activities? Yeah. 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 And for, for, for monitoring and evaluation, because I think that Amir is going, what are we monitoring and evaluating? You know, mm -hmm. is it, you know, we, we, we gave you $1 million, mm -hmm. you went and bought something worth $1 million. Okay. But how has that actually impacted the space within which you're working? So shifting, monitoring and evaluation away from outcomes and more towards impacts of, of uh, interventions, I think is a very important piece of the puzzle. I think there are outcomes, uh, but I have a problem with outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are outcomes, uh, but I have, I have a problem with these outcomes. Uh, uh, and you say uh, that conservation is about teamwork, and you realize that uh, there's nothing awarding an individual for excellence in this work. But I find that uh, actually still fragmenting communities. You work in a community, you go get uh, without any, uh, any, uh, any, uh, any negative connotations. Uh, I think we need to actually uh, decolonize all these issues to the extent that we give community awards. Uh, I know uh, Peter is here, he has won an award, excellent. But uh, to what extent does, is a community aware that they have contributed to you getting that award? Mm. See, to what extent <coughs> are they? It's not nothing about. So the issue about uh, object, uh, uh, objectifying people and uh, creating a symbol of success, to me, is actually shifting <coughs> conservation in the leg. See, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because most of the things are done collectively, and it requires collective uh, approach and uh, interventions and. Uh, 
but we, 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 having this issue where we, we give individual individual awards and all this issue, it uh, ends up uh, actually promoting individualism in terms of uh, trying to achieve, you see, other than going for uh, how conservation has organized or creating a, an hybrid of uh, self-organizing capacity for that community to be able to manage and govern their own resources. See? So for me, there, there are still a number of issues that uh, we really need, uh, mm -hmm. conservation can do better. Uh, and uh, well, uh, to me, I think there are a number of uh, positive things that happen in conservation. Mm -hmm. It's only that uh, we always end up creating this one small case study. And, oh, she's, she's, she's an amazing person, you know, she's doing all this. But what about uh, so many other amazing people down there? Mm -hmm. You see? So this, to me, is uh, um, creating classes within this uh, within a community, and uh, of course, we, you may not agree, but you, you you have created power within that person, and how that person engages and manages issues within that community will be different. Okay, I want to bring up two different issues that are Yeah, I think uh, yeah, yeah, that's what. operations are 
national or how many are run by Kenyan nationals? <coughs> um, I don't know what the answer is to that, but I would definitely say the tourism department. <laughs> 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 I think, I think uh, yeah. yeah. I think tourism in Kenya, well, so first of all, I think, and this might be the case across Africa, there's, there's become a really massive misconception of what conservation actually is, in the sense of, you know, tree planting outside your home, you know, looking for, all of that, when we talked about conservation, soil conservation, water conservation, all of that used to be part of the, uh, you know, package. But these days when you say conservation, immediately, instantly, people figure, think of, you know, yeah, exactly. Wildlife, people taking photos of the big, you know, big game with you know, the sexy animals, and that's that's what people focus on. Forget some of the smaller issues, and the danger with that is then if you commodify the the land that uh, this tourism is happening on, based on the success or the ability of that land to to provide tourism dollars. Let's take you know con conservancies in Northern Kenya, for example. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very well blessed in terms of wildlife, in terms of panorama. You go to Westgate, Kalama, you know, Sarah, you all these massive panoramas with lots of beautiful, bountiful wildlife. So it's easy for those, you know, conservancies and areas to take, you know, uh, tourism as a as a valid sort of benefit of conservation, you know, it, with its own issues, but uh, in you know in the in the larger sense. But if we go somewhere like you know Maybay or you know Nasulu or you know mm -hmm. Nakuputra, you know some of those conservancies that maybe don't have as clear direct link between uh, the land being owned and the, the the value for tourism, then how do those pieces of land find value in conservation? What is it that they're making? How are they going to make money off of conservation if the if tourism is the only option available for them? And you know, like Anka mentioned something earlier about um, some of these organizations we work with replacing, if you will, the, 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 the place of the government. And I think this is one of the big um, tragedies of our time is how marginalized these lands have been in the development conversation. Where I, now, as soon as someone has brought this shiny new, you know, get out of jail free car tourism, that's what everybody wants to go for. But some of the things that they're trying to get through that they could have been getting through regular government, you know, development programs. And you know, I don't know if it's just a Kenyan issue, but it's just something that we've sort of lost sight of what conservation is. And by by forcing tourism to be the only way that we can monetize conservation, then we put a lot of people. We make places, for example, that don't have wildlife, but maybe have, you know. Uh, Springs or rock formations, or maybe interesting plant for you know plant plant uh, plant life, they are lower down on the totem pole um, as opposed to actual uh, you know, big five areas. So I don't know, just some food for thought. Yeah, um, I think uh, I think uh, uh, Peter about uh, natural resources and the dollar mm -hmm. is uh, it's because of the narrative that actually. Uh, have been brought to these communities. <coughs> if, uh, think about the narratives that have been advanced through documentaries, milking the rhino. <laughs> think about that. And uh, I always go, I'm a member of the uh, consultant, uh, uh, and uh, they always say, you know, we can milk these animals and then they get the money. See? So that it's about the narrative. And I remember uh, it started very pretty well when during the when the t uh, community in CDTF and the t uh, tourist trust fund. So and uh, I remember I was uh, I was talking to some elders uh, when it started in, in especially in a place called Motiok. So uh, there was this narrative every time uh, they say you know we bring an investor every year the investor will be giving you one million. So one one elder was asking uh, asking a, in a meeting in a public meeting. He said that uh, at the start, but you told us one million annually. In Motiok, you said one million. That's it. That's it. That never changed. And you know, for Maze, if you ask them uh, one million, they don't have a word for that. <laughs> so it's uh, like a big thing. Mm -hmm. You see? And for pastoralists, by any chance, if there's anything that can happen so that he doesn't sell his cow to meet that, then that's, that, that's a plus for them. 
So when you tell them that you, you, by you uh, getting into conservation, because of you getting one million, of course, you'll be, uh, you, you, are, uh, you are on the top of the scale for that community. So it's a narrative that we, we've created, and it is hard for us uh, in this kind of uh, discussions to change that narrative. You see, and this is a problem because I see a number of organizations getting into this problem. They now want to come and talk about rangelands restoration. People already think that you, you spoke about the dollars, not about the restoration. And you're already wanting to bring some incentives for people to restore their rangelands. You see? you're still talking about money. So you are not talking about how do we as a community reflect and respond to the challenges that we've got, you see, uh, uh, within us, so that at least, we, uh, uh, and then you're still bringing in an aspect about, okay, off-take, strategic livestock off-take, access to markets. You're still talking about money, how you can really, see? You still, so it's not necessarily about e ecotourism, whether you're talking about eco the dollar or eco the environment. <laughs> Uh, uh, you're still talking about money, and you are, you, you are helping you are helping communities to shift. And this is happening. Whether you are talking about the fat earning ABCD, you have mm -hmm. created an elitist conservation model. So you, when you are talking about even, we, we, we need to add another class of elitism within us. So, because if you look across the landscape, the livestock per capita, may not uh, per capita, may not have increased per household. But looking to the elites, they are the ones who have the jobs so they can afford to buy and keep livestock. My father sells his because he, needs, he has to keep it. I, but I will keep mine as long as the market out to the when the market uh, gets better. So we, you could be lying to yourself that we are helping and creating access to market. You are creating elitist conservation on benefits that further fragment the community. Um, yeah, and just, just to double tap on, your, on the question of narrative, it's not just a narrative that we hear in the communities, it's a narrative that uh, we're taught in school. And we all sang the song that wildlife is important because it brings tourism, which brings foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. We didn't even know what foreign exchange was <laughs> at the time. <laughs> 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 but you know wildlife like brought it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That was enough, and that was so. So, so yes, this is a narrative that does that does need to, to change. Um, I want to go to uh, an emotive topic, which I know that the panel will not agree on at all, and I'm sure we will actually um, have a lot of diverse opinions on this. It's about the guns and boots in conservation. Um, conservation has been accused by some people of carrying out green colonialism, equipping people to wage a war on behalf of nature. Um, so I'd like to know from the panelists, and maybe I'll also shoot this to the audience, if you believe that there's a place for that. And why should this be part of the discussion? Um, if may, maybe somebody can answer that. <coughs> I don't know which one. I think I'll just start <laughs> off because this, this question, we, I, I told you it's one of the sort of um, big questions of sort of my, my, my involvement in conservation, which is, and I think that's the first time I mentioned to you the whole tyranny, the delivery, removal of nuance concept, which is, I live and work in an area where there's constant attempts to infiltrate and poach by very heavily un armed you know, uh, outsiders, <coughs> which by default then means that we also have to be strategic and you know sort of it's almost like an arms race if you will in terms of between the protectors and the you know quote unquote um, infiltrators and so I guess my, my, my question was that's my that's my sort of thinking of the necessity behind that but having talked to people in the communities as well and people also complaining that yeah we don't need guns in conservation my question was yeah okay I need to hear more from people like that to understand exactly what that part of the lens looks like. Because from where I'm standing, if we don't have, and yes, there's, there's a lot of other strategies that are used in terms of communities and intelligence and all of that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's like the famous American, you know, it's, I find myself 
sometimes saying things that when I listen back to them afterwards, I'm like, did I just turn into a, you know, Second Amendment? <laughs> not, uh, because sometimes you'll hear people say, the only thing that can stop a bad person with a gun is a good person with a gun. And sometimes I'll say something and it'll come very close to that and I'll have to like sit back and think, okay, I need to rethink this, this statement. And so for me, it's not even having a position. It's me trying to figure out what is, what's people's perspective on this and what's the, what's the narrative out there outside this area of ours. And so for me, that was why I, I was asking about this question is just wanting to, to hear diverse voices um, from this aspect. Yeah, I mean, I also had this dilemma. So, uh, I mean, I work in a place which is very large and has, for the most part, um, most of the conservation money has gone into guns and boots rather than community development over the 18 years um, that I've been here, aside from the small stuff that, that we've been able to do. And what I've seen it do is actually create more of an us and them because this is a protected area, but it has 60,000 people living inside it. So I think it really much, very much depends on the area in which you work, whether you're doing fortress conservation and there are no people inside and you're protecting rhino or whatever it is, or whether you're actually in this huge landscape that has traditionally and historically had people in it who it's their homes and that's where their ancestors are buried, that's where their pedestrian routes are, it's where they live and breathe and have their children, and then you have this hugely militarized response to poaching. And, and make no mistake, the place that I work in the Yasta Reserve has lost 10,000 elephants to, to poaching. Mm -hmm. So this is not, this, I'm not talking about poaching. This is serious, organized poaching. But I really don't see that the militarized response has created a future for conservation in the place that I'm in because it hasn't been balanced. And the other thing is that the rules are not clear. So while there are very strict rules for war, mm -hmm. there are no rules, as far as I can figure out, on the on the ground implementation of these guns and boots policies where um, and this is this is speaking on a much broader level, not, not specifically where, where where people talk about people disappearing, where they talk about roaches being seen in the bush and then um, you know, extrajudicial killings or torturing people to get information from <coughs> intelligence. But there are no rules. And so my main concern with the guns and boots approach is that if you're gonna have a guns and boots approach, and we're gonna bring in the British Army or the American Army, and we're gonna train up with all these military approaches to this problem, then we need to have very clear rules and we need to tell the communities who are living there what those rules are. Have we declared war? Have we told them that, that what the rules are in this? Is there a clear um, shoot to kill policy, or is it only if you if you if you happen to look like you're carrying a firearm, can you be out? Because we have people walking everywhere, mm -hmm. and so um, my feeling is that we've gone so far along the guns and boots narrative across Africa that it's now time to pull back and say, okay, what are the rules? What are the rules about this? What does this mean for conservation in the future? And what is and how do we how do we make sure that this is not killing conservation rather than and just solving an immediate problems. So I don't know what the answers are, but I'm very concerned with a lot of what I see because I think it against human rights. Mm -hmm. Can I interject yeah. and, and just say, you know, kind of bring in why I brought in this question as well. Um, you know, this is this is my own personal opinion, is also how the narrative gets told um, internationally. Um, and just like David said, that at some point we begin to wonder how we sound. And wherever you work and you're, you're really worried about these criminal networks and, and you're always talking about that, there reaches a point where to whoever it is who doesn't know very much about this continent, uh, you paint a picture of a single story, which is that we need people in green uniform to stand against the rest of the bad Africans because the rest of them are all bad Africans. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that for me was why I really wanted to bring in this question, but I really appreciated that we have panelists who have nuance and who are actually there. And, and there are places where these things are necessary. Um, but yes, we need rules. Yeah, and also just to, sorry, just to add that, you know, when I brought it up in meetings, both, you know, um, you know, as a woman, it's, it's 
hard to do that because immediately you get you're too soft, you're too emotional, you're, and you and and I think that this needs a broader discussion because it, that's not what it's about. Yeah, yeah I think. Uh, I think for uh, um, I've been, been tracking down this issue since it started in like Kipia community-based conservation, especially in the sanctuaries, the private sanctuaries. I know of, for a fact that uh, communities are, uh, for the reason why communities, for instance, agreed to conservation, especially even in Wesi, was because uh, they have access to guns and to protect their livestock. Except we call it security. Yeah, yeah, we call right. it security, you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you see? We call it security. So uh, it's, it, it was a kind of a, a buffer zone. We know the challenges, of course. Uh, we know the challenges, of course. We have to protect the, we know the challenges about it really kind of struggling uh, to bring the numbers up again for the elephant on this. But no, uh, it, it happened that I was in, I had, uh, had, uh, had a team from Niatero in Ilmeti on, on the 7th that night. Two rhinos were killed, were poached within uh, within uh, within uh, within <coughs> Lewa, uh, unfortunately. But saying that, everybody will say, "Oh no, well, it can't happen. That's an inside job." Who will go into Lewa? Uh, we also <laughs> some state might they say they have everything. Uh, someone's even saying, "Oh, if, if you touch that wire, they, they can uh, tell the position <laughs> where you are." You see, it's, it's not possible. So this thing, militarization of conservation, I think, uh, uh, is a very big challenge. And it, it will be a, a much more bigger problem in future. I'm trying to see northern Kenya uh, now and the previous years. And I want to project it even to another, uh, what's happening and the trends. Uh, we see a lot of, uh, a number of, uh, the, the space and natural resources for nomadic pastoralism is shrinking the mobility. So we only expect much more pastoralists to be able to, to drop out of uh, that livelihood. People whose skill is nature-based, and they need that skill to survive. So uh, shrinking spaces for livestock uh, and all that. So eventually, we'll have a huge population of people who are jobless. And uh, to me, I think there'll be a much more bigger problem in poaching in the future. People have to survive. And because uh, we don't accept it, and uh, uh, we don't accept it, and but it will t it will come to to, um, to that to the fact that um, it's become much more harder to be a pastoralist, uh, especially because uh, if you lose one cow, it takes you about another another six years for you to come to full recovery. And if that happens, because before that comes, you're into another drought, so it's unlikely that you'll ever recover. It's unlikely that when you are drop out of pastoralism, uh, and, uh, and, and the conservationists will not agree uh, that um, uh, this compete. It used to be conservation, but it's competing mm -hmm. for spaces for conservation as well as uh, as well as uh, as well as for livestock. And of course, conservation is taking the way because it has a, a lot of legislative framework. We don't have a pastoralism policy in Kenya. Uh, people say you have to change. I don't know to change to be what. Uh, uh, so for me, and of course we just been discussing this thing, we are dealing with a, a situation where uh, an, an organization that's supposed to play a lead policy role, uh, KWS, which is supposed to play that role, is not doing it because of a number of structural reasons and also a lot of other things. Even it's, uh, you should not complain about uh, un being underfunded because Kenya government is said is not funding it. So, and you come to the same thing that I've been discussing, that today. so why is it so popular? It's because you promise people to create employment. You will be employing uh, 50 rangers. Mm -hmm. And who are these people if you look critically? Um, a, a number of them are related to those people who sit on the committees and the boards of those conservancies. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a power relations is still an issue there. Mm -hmm. And then why, why, do you, wh why do we like it? It's not so much because of the elephant and the lions and all that. It's but because we protect our livestock. You see, this, to me, this is very important. Uh, and people uh, like this. And if, if you bring, and I've been, uh, I've been engaging a lot with a, a, a county government. And the, this debate came in one when we were training the community, the uh, the the, uh, the members of county assembly on community land. 
and the issues about guns came. You know, so they told me, you know, it's a Samburu guy. They said, no, don't talk about that. No, this is, this is a blessing for us. It's guns is a blessing for us. So don't don't tell this it facilitators not to talk about it so much. We like it. <laughs> you, you know. So and that is already the reason why it will be another challenge for conservation in northern Kenya is it, it having guns is not uh, equally distributed within the communities. So that creates and will be a problem for these issues. So and unless they support a system uh, where I say 50 guns for the Borana, 50 ABCD, mm -hmm. so that we know that we equal, but we still have, have our own, the, the ones that have not, we have them under here. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it will be another, uh, it will be something that will be serious in the landscape. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I want to to wrap this up and then we want to talk to the audience. Yeah, and just quickly, because I actually think, Alexander, you've yeah. really, I think, given a really clear perspective on this issue, and I think we have a Northern Kenyan bias, which is okay, but. Yeah. You know, I think that there's an interesting discussion to be had about the role of, you know, guns and security once the formalization <coughs> of the type of protected area that we're talking about has already been formalized. I get a little bit concerned and worried <coughs> when militarization is the form of formalizing some you know, a type of conservation, and that guns become the tool for making that a protected wildlife space. And I think that's something that we've seen in other areas that is concerning. Mm -hmm. If I just say quickly that it's also about funding, because yep. um, funding for anti poaching is, um, as, as someone that fundraises for both, mm -hmm. um, is a lot easier than funding for community programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's also because monitoring and evaluation is a lot simpler. So you have how many ranges, how many races, how many tenants, how many, how many, whatever you have. So the, the numbers are very simple. Whereas for social community programs, the, the monitoring and evaluation is a lot harder. Just to sort of wrap, I know, I know we, we keep wrapping it up, but <laughs> again, this is an issue I'm very, I'm very, I'm very uh, sort of passionate about. And I think one of the things that the panelists have mentioned is, I think we have an idea of what the long-term, you know, um, solution to a lot of these issues is. I think, you know, if, if we had more equitable distribution of resources and access to those resources to the communities in North Kenya, livelihoods uh, such that they're not incompatible with pastoralism. You know, I know you mentioned rangeland restoration. I, I, I still need to figure out why it's a negative thing. I think we've, we've pointed rangeland degradation as one of the largest challenges to not just wildlife conservation, but you know, life pastoralism and livelihoods in, in a lot of landscapes, not just Northern Kenya, because if you think about the fact that a good 70% of rangelands across Eastern Africa are degraded. Mm -hmm. And that's, so as the people, you're, you're very right, as you're saying, as the population increases, the, the resource base isn't static, it's actually also shrinking, because that you know, degradation is, is, is get, it's a positive feedback. As the more degraded a place becomes, the more degraded it will, be, it will become. And so I think some of those solutions we have in, the, in, the, in, in our mind in the future, and the truth is, if there was no market for, for rhino horn, and tusks and the like, poaching as an issue would probably be way further down on the on the list. And actually, need for need for. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned the lower fence because mm -hmm. you know we tell people the the fence isn't to keep people out. The fence is to keep rhino in because there's so many places for people to be able to get into into lower through the fence or through the gates. The fence is to keep the rhino in. If those rhinos were you know, had the ability to move out and <coughs> be safe out in the community. If we got to a situation like that, then the whole conversation also around fencing also becomes a, a you know, a, a different conversation, which is its own monster that I don't want to touch right now. But, okay, yeah. people. Um, there is a lot of issues. <laughs> um, let's start. If you have questions, if you have comments, let's, let's take three at a time. Um, one, two, uh, two. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, Moses. Right, uh, my name is Moses. Um, I just wanted to say um, two things, actually, and it's actually a solution, I guess. Um, I like that you raised the issue of privilege, and I think we all acknowledge here that all of us, in some way or the other, have been beneficial of privilege. I'll speak of my own, actually. Um, I've been privileged to be part of an award board, which 
I guess, in some situations, I've been the token person of color. But there's a consciousness that has helped me in those situations where you might be put in a position in a token context, but that's still an opportunity to you know, impact change. You know what I mean? Like I've been in discussions where we're talking about hiring an expat, and the budget for that is 500,000. Then someone says, and not in a racist context, I guess it's just out of, um, just the way it is, you know, let's get a Kenyan to do it for 100,000. And I'm the person who'll speak up and say, that's, that's, that's not going to fly. You know, and I've seen an impact in that. My point is, I like what someone said in terms of you could use your privilege in a, in a positive way. <laughs> and then I just wanted to say, I guess I'm lucky because I'm not really, I've come into conservation <laughs> from, a, from an outside profession. And based on my experience so far, you speak to everyone and it's all whispered. We all know there's gatekeepers, especially when it comes to raising the big bucks in Africa, right? <coughs> and those lot, let's just be honest, it's all about legacy, not all of them, but some of them, right? And if they wanted to, they could empower mm -hmm. people and empower successes. Mm -hmm. Because you can't tell me that it's all about, I hear your point about corruption and all of that. No, I don't think that's the only point. Because in other contexts, I've worked in human rights and we were able to raise a lot of money just us ourselves as Kenyans or whoever. That narrative that exists, actually, you would find, if you look deep into it, you might find it's one or two individuals across Africa who, by that narrative being intact, they control resources, maintain lifestyles, and maintain legacy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in human rights, we always say, you know, you've got to really take the bullet. You know, just, you know, like, say, for example, I personally never shy away from mentioning certain individuals who I think it's <coughs> not ideal to work with because either the idea will be stolen or this or that will happen. Honestly, if there's consequences, that's fine, but you've got to live with your truth in that context because I just firmly believe that this cause is, it's not even altruism, it's like a calling, you know what I mean? Like, And then, sorry, my third point, in terms of empowerment and resources, and I always say from a legal perspective, these resources, say, I'll speak for Kenya, for example, within this jurisdiction, say for example for the Maasai Mara and all of that and for those gatekeepers when I've had an opportunity to speak to them, I tell them at the end of the day, if you don't empower the people who legally you know, have the, 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 the privilege, the duty and everything to protect these resources when you're gone, it's a wrap, you know what I mean so, I don't know I just think I'm like, so. <laughs> What your thoughts are on what the alternative is. If not that, then what? And lastly, uh, yeah, well, so I think you mentioned before that more money goes um, into Africa. It's actually the other way around. More money goes out of Africa every year than comes in. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah so uh, I mean, if you add up aid and mm -hmm. trade and, and everything, um, Africa is actually a net uh, creditor. Rest of the world, so mm. I think I, I think that's really profound because first of all, there's more than enough money in Africa for all of us, right? So corruption is, you know, a lot of this is going into people's pockets, right? A lot of the yeah, and that's um, and I think it, it means that the, there's actually a lot of power here. There's a lot of latent power that's not being used. It's not being mobilized, and I think gatekeeper is the uh, key key term as a bad thing. But also the bad thing because um, I think conservation is so used. I also come from outside of conservation. I'm not a biologist, or anything. but uh, yeah, I think kind of like the existing kind of conservation community holds on to this gatekeeper role, like with the death, the death grip, and that's uh, it's a big problem. And so, and that manifests itself in a lot of different ways, like these aristocratic landowners who you know have their their way of doing things, or like the militarization, I think is also really interesting because uh, how many people have been in the military? Anyone? Okay. So uh, I mean, there's there's military. Uh, militaries have lots of rules. They have lots of different types of missions. 
It's not, I mean, these are paramilitary forces, so it needs to be militarized, as in they need rules of engagement. They need life insurance for their, for the families, and they need all that stuff that the military actually provides very well and have lots of doctrine to do. So militarization is a good thing, isn't it? It's actually it making it professional, yeah. making it's it not professionalization, professional. yeah. right? Botswana <coughs> is the military that does anti poaching So it's kind of, when you say it's militarized, it's a military mission, so. Yeah, anyway, some um, just for the panel who is, uh, takes the questions, I just want to remind you all that this is a safe space. Um, and I think that it's important to remember that because we've gone into like issues. Um, but I think there might have been people who were here with issues. So if, if you have those, you know, you can tell your truth and, and ask your question in, in, that, in that way. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yes. I think one thing that hasn't come up um, is succession. That's yeah, a true. really important issue. Um, I was kind of surprised when I chatted to Rosanna about it because I don't know if it's a Kenyan thing, um, and maybe I'm just completely um, not aware of it because I didn't watch. Um, Rosanna asked me, did I have any intention of handing over our project to our children? It has never occurred. <laughs> Our children have grown up in the bush, I homeschool them, they're now going off to homeschooling, um, to, to um, other schools. But it has never occurred to me that our conservation project is a legacy that I give my children. And I found that very surprising, and I think it's something that we need to examine. Because our intention is that in the next five to seven years we step out, board and slowly so that we don't collapse the whole thing and our, ma ma our managers move into director positions and our middle managers move up because we have all these seven levels and, and that the project continues by everybody moving through um, and earning the same salaries as everybody else as they move through and all, you know, all our salaries and everything are completely transparent. Our managers know how much I earn and it's completely transparent. But I found that a very interesting question because uh, it has never occurred to me. That there was this, this idea that the upper echelon only existed for certain people. And I think it's something that we need to examine if that is the case across all of conservation. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I would have been very sad if I looked through my question sheet and thought that we didn't go through that because I think that's a very important and sometimes quite painful thing. And I talked to Colin about it and said that. Um, it, it's, it's a very disempowering feeling to know that you will never get there. <laughs> uh, you're never going to move up. You're never going to make the decisions for an organization that you um, honestly love. Um, yes. Just very interesting to hear everyone talk about succession and conservation. And following on to what Paulina says, I think the more pertinent question is conservation for who? Yeah. You know? Is it about your legacy? Is it about the species? Is it about the people that you're working with to make sure that there's sustainability in our children's lives? So as we talk about succession and ponder about power in politics, let's think about conservation for who and for what. Yes. I think that ties very well with one of the things we discussed, which is the, the issue of capacity building, mm -hmm. which I think you only have one chance to be able to say that we did not hire a Kenyan person because there was not a Kenyan person qualified to do this job. You can only say that once. Because from there, I think it should be legally mandated that, not just Kenya, but you know, across Africa, it should be legally mandated that any position that doesn't have a Kenyan person you know, qualified enough to do it right now, you're building a system where Kenyans are actually trained uh, to be able to do those jobs. So whatever it is, those skills or you know, qualifications it is you think are lacking, you have a mandate as an organization to make sure that you're providing that um, capacity building, you know, for your staff to be able to get there eventually. Not that every other five years that person retires, you do another round and you bring in another person on top of those same people. And those people didn't receive the capacity building they would have needed to transition to that uh, perspective. Right, because if the reason that we believe that we should have foreigners, right? Like I'm not from Kenya, 
here working in conservation is that we need a diversity of skill sets and worldviews and ways of solving <coughs> problems and that together we're stronger. Like if that's the reason why we should have just not an all Kenya conservation mafia, right? Like mm -hmm. if we should have more people involved, then why is it that every expat is at the top of the organization, mm -hmm. right? If, if it's really about the diversity of mm -hmm. thought, the diversity of engagement, then we should have bosses that are Kenyan, right? Like that's... I think uh, there's one uh, important point for me. Uh, if conservation really, at the end of the day, has to be successful, you also need to strengthen cultures that have helped uh, con uh, conservation, when real conservation was conservation. I'm talking about indigenous cultures, mm -hmm. you know, you see? Those, that is about, uh, they have got animal totems, you know, all this issue, they have, you know, all these things exist, and uh, I, I think, <coughs> to me, strengthening language, culture, and uh, wildlife conservation, nature conservation, I like saying nature conservation, it should be go and, and because the moment uh, the moment these cultures become weak, and that's exac exactly you look. It, 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 I, I always monitor the, uh, those people who are in court because of poaching, and you realize these are people who have been to school. They drop out, and then they are, they, they, they are not in, into the. They are somewhere. They don't fit into that because uh, and because uh, of the nature that education has created. You see. So it, it, it's a, a, a sword that cuts both so it, it empowers mm -hmm. and it's, it's empowered. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, I think, uh, and um, what's, the, what's the way forward, actually, in terms of like that? Because to me, I think, uh, to me, I think um, the kind of, mo the current model won't really last for long. It won't la uh, last for long because uh, uh, eventually, communities will, kind of will be go against each other's throats. Uh, and to me, I think uh, we uh, Kenya Wildlife Service, need, uh, the government needs to really play a, mega, uh, a major role in terms of regulating this so that it plays that role, so that communities continue doing their own other functions and as they used to be. But I think right now, the way it is, it is uh, it's an industry because uh, uh, we have even created a strategic uh, organizations that do that purpose to train. Uh, to train uh, uh, I find like if I always, I always meet uh, some uh, some old white guys. Oh, I'm a retired military guy. What do you do? I consult for uh, this and that company. I train. Oh, I train those guys. You know. So you know. So we are creating more industries to to legitimize militarization. Mm -hmm. eh? We are legitimizing a lot of things that we know are not correct, uh, and uh, it will be a little bit much more difficult for that. To be, uh, uh, and also to come to your question about uh, pendulous restoration, we did not, we, 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 we did not, w I, I think we are doing this unconsciously. We don't want to accept it, but we say community-based conservation, but we end up restricting pastoralist mobility. And then you are accelerating degradation in, in the small spaces you are laying out. Because people, that they, they, you have cut off this mobility in the way that you saw, you are creating a problem by solving another problem. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think these things need to be discussed in an open uh, place. Uh, and they still come to, uh, my feature of this is transboundary ecosystem management, like EPA, see? So that, and they, uh, it's a, they will require huge investment in terms of re restoring what we have, of course, we have our, our own issue about tribals and all this, about ethnic issues, negative ethnicity. But I think it will be better to invest heavily into this so that you can save a large, large, large landscape that, that is northern Kenya and other spaces uh, across the world by allowing people to interact in an organized manner. And uh, I think to, well, I mean, instead of talking about Lewa, let's talk about transnational, transboundary ecosystem management all the way to, uh, <coughs> if you're talking about, and that's exactly how the, uh, the elephant is designed to operate. Goes to Marsabit, come back. You know, uh, if pastoralists are able to do that again, then I, I, see, I see a success in conservation. We go over to the social for the evening. We go over to the social. Would, would some people like to stay and ask their questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we're gonna take we're gonna take three more questions, and those who would like to leave, I think if, if we can move somehow so that, or maybe I just open this door. <laughs> so if anybody wants to just 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you can gradually yeah. Yeah. keep asking mm -hmm. the questions, I don't think I will make a conclusion mm -hmm. because I think that there, there are very many issues and I, I would like the questions to be asked because I think there is a good value in asking these questions. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Naya. Yes. <laughs> yes, at the very back. And, <coughs> and, and Tonya. Yeah. Okay. So my question is a more social and personal question. When you're being, when you're not receiving the same treatment, whether it's because of gender, whether it's because of your skin, how do you stop yourself from internalizing those emotions and it affecting your self-worth or your ability to do your job? So if, for example, and it's shown in a practical way, so let's say, <coughs> well, my, my white colleague, was, I mean, three times the amount I was, and we're doing the same thing. We have the same qualifications, whatnot. How do I stop myself, or well, not how do I stop myself, how do you s stay motivated mm -hmm. and stop internalizing those narratives and those those frameworks that are already so instilled and structural that are not always, they're not things that are gonna change quickly. And it's the mundane day-to-day -day existing and reminding yourself why it's worth it. And you know, keep on being beaten down, even if it's not open anymore. You know, <laughs> it's the why, why bother? So I guess that's the question. How do you stop yourself from internalizing those, or how do you push past that and stay strong, even though, though you know that it's not? Can I ask one mm -hmm. panelist to answer that, and then can I ask somebody from the audience who might have an experience like this as well to, to chime in and, and, and answer, answer that question? Because this is not a an expertise question, this is, this is a, that sort of question. Um, yes. So my question is for anyone in the room, um, and it's about African money. So Dangote is Nigerian, I'm Nigerian, and he's the richest, one of the richest on the continent. Awoshika is another woman who is extremely rich, and she's Nigerian and African. And the question for me is why aren't they given to conservation? And, and I'm, I spent time thinking about this because as a Nigerian, there are not many Nigerians or I dare say West Africans who think about conservation. And I have my conclusions about this, but I'm wondering, especially for people who fundraise in the room, have you tried to sell conservation to the African billionaires? And what was the response? Why it didn't work? Or why haven't you tried? I, I haven't, fundraising is something that I've sort of been one step removed from. So I haven't had to directly try, but I'm curious if there's anyone in the room who has tried. Because part of the narrative, in my opinion, is that until Africans begin to fund conservation, some of these issues are not going to resolve themselves. So I'm wondering if anyone in the room has tried this to market to an African billionaire or millionaire, and what was the response, and how did it go? Okay, and the last question is from Antonia. Um, can I just add a few points to my question as well? Um, first of all, thank you for hosting this really interesting but difficult topic, like firstly. But um, I want to point out that in this room, we've often said African, where I think we mean black, and I feel that there are quite a few white Africans here as well. So I just want to make that point, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and secondly, I want to open white privilege um, as a white guilt as well, and how, does anyone have any tools for how I can deal with it? So I've been working in Laikipia, which for those of us who <laughs> know Laikipia is very difficult, and if I wasn't white, I wouldn't be able to work for some of these difficult private branches, for example, they wouldn't open up in the same way, and I've been told this by my boss, by colleagues, by many people, and I don't know how to handle that, and I would appreciate any tools for that. Would like to start with Nina's question. I think, I think that's a very big challenge, and uh, uh, and uh, to, to for my my on my own personal story, uh, I think uh, I've, been, I've been motivated in, in, in activism and all this, but I found my children growing up in uh, all this knowing that their, their father is a terrible person. Because that's what I've been branded in like here. So oh that, that's that's a bad guy, you see. So what I did, I shifted my family to Kadiad. But I'm still <laughs> operating. So but but the interesting thing, uh, my firstborn daughter is a filmmaker, so she went back to that to get into the story. 
and the second board is a red ecologist. She's still into that area. So mm. I don't know, I, I'll have to ask them how they think, uh, how bad I am or how good I am. But, <laughs> but that's, uh, to me, I, I think the, the spaces, uh, the civic spaces are, uh, uh, are opening up sh uh, and shrinking at some spaces and some areas. So uh, there's a network of uh, all these activists and uh, how they, they link up. And uh, you know, we are engaged internationally and uh, when, when you get other spaces where you share your story and people take it uh, positively, it mo motivates you. But uh, I think also what has encouraged is also uh, Kenyan civic space has been over the last couple of years uh, uh, improving for people like us who talk about these issues on a very uh, criminalizing uh, uh, is still there, and uh, I think uh, uh, for me, I think it's something because there's no, there's no, there's nobody who can help you with all these negativities. We don't have the Kenyan police and Kenyan army doesn't have uh, uh, the therapy. It's official; it's not there. So uh, they were beginning to think about it. What about the Kenyan police? Why are they killing themselves and all this? Uh, so you can imagine about the activists and the rest of us. Where this growing negativity and all these challenges is not very easy. I can tell you. Does anybody have uh, something to offer? Yes. And just to add. I think at the beginning of the conference, they told us about wellness and conservation and finding affirmative spaces where you can ground yourself and find yourself even where you're struggling to stay motivated. So for me, I think one way to deal with this is to find those safe spaces, affirmative places, or you have a place to go to. But we hope that there will be structural change to this I, I would like to add that, you know, it's important to find the spaces, but it's also important to admit that what is happening is wrong. Yes. Yeah. Um, and once we've admitted that it's wrong, and there are many of us, then you know, taking it is not a so question much. of taking it to any authority to try and yeah. work out that balance. It should not be a question of I'm a one person doing a one thing, and then now I'm taking my whole organization to court by itself. I mean, that can happen, and that, that there, there is definitely a space for that, but we need to we, as, as people who are aware of this issue, need to start speaking about it in the right places and actually try and make sure that these frameworks come into our government spaces. I know a lot of us are Kenyans, there are Nigerians in this room, there are all sorts of other, other people represented here. Our governments need to do something about this. If, if there's somebody who's earning three times as much as, as you for doing the same work, um, and they, they are here, we need to deal with that. It's, it shouldn't be a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and and no, the thing is, it's actually, there's places we, we have precedent, yeah. like at least for Kenyans anyway, there's now precedent legally mm -hmm. of an organization being forced to restructure its pay scale mm -hmm. because they were paying white yeah. uh, employees like four times. obscenely higher mm -hmm. than what they were paying the African employees for the same services. So there's precedent now that can be used legally to, to, to fight the case. So it's not just a, a theoretical uh, whistleblowing thing. It's actually practically you can do that. I think we address the other questions as well. So, yeah, so just, uh, just to um, address the white guilt thing. I mean, going from South Africa, I'm actually part of guilt. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a South African condition, whichever way you look at it. But, um, but I just want to say that I think there are different ways of looking at that. And, and I know in our team we do it quite often, is that who, who is the best person to do this job? Who is the best person to, you know, whatever your vision is and your purpose is for your organization, they're going to meet people, there's sometimes that my husband is the right person to go in. There's sometimes where he's, he's just, it will become aggressive and it won't work and that a, a woman is the best person to go in. The other times where it's one of those vegans are the best person people to go in and then sometimes it's us that to go in. So I think as long as it's seen in that light, is who can get the result which is best for conservation, whatever the whatever the, the Nikepia um, guys think, or, or the reasons why that's happening, if your organization is strong enough to actually say, this is the reason you're going in there, but it's to get a certain result, then, then I don't think you have to feel guilty about anything at all. If somebody believes that you've only got the job because you happen to be a certain race, and that they could have done the job equally well as you, then that's clearly a problem. But I think we have to realize that in some conversations, there's some people or some instances 
because there's some people who can get a better result and the other people who <coughs> can't. Um, and you know, it's also just a personality thing. I mean, you we have some people in our organization who are extroverts, some are introverts. Um, some are good at negotiating conflict, some are willing to not make. So, you know, if, so if you see it in that light, then I think that you can get rid of the white guilt. Um, could somebody else do what you're doing and get that relationship? And, or, or are you taking away someone else's job? Mm -hmm. In that case, they're two completely different things. Yeah, and just sorry, to that, to that point, I think a lesson actually that comes out of that space in Kenya is that I think, I think expats have a responsibility to, um, to not perpetuate the historical separations in society in this country. I think that there are a lot of divisions. I think if you look at the city of Nairobi, where people choose to live, how it's all segregated, I think that's the same in Laikipia. And I, and I do think it's the next generation's responsibility, and it's people who come into that, their responsibility to break down those barriers and, and to create more spaces of, of openness and diversity and cooperation, because that has not been the history mm -hmm. in these spaces. And, and I think that you have to be very conscious of perpetuating that, which I think then comes to being honest with who you are, like who you are, who you represent, how you act, right? There's an individualism to it, and then there's the societal part, and yeah. I, I just like to say that there's, you know, all these things are probably not going to be easy, and the idea of breaking down those sorts of barriers means that it needs pioneers, and those pioneers will, will go through a lot. But I am hoping that the, this is, you know, the, one of the themes of this panel was courage, that we actually will have the courage to do some hard things. Um, yes. I, I guess that, uh, I mean, to, for me, uh, the way forward is actually to discuss these issues at a much more lower uh, level. And I think we started this, uh, we, we, got, uh, we, we organized a, a dialogue around these issues. We invited a number of uh, funders and uh, communities, and it was, it was very much heated. Uh, uh, it was very much heated uh, with a lot of negativity and all this. But I think uh, I'm happy that at least one, the Nature Conservancy called me this morning and asked me, you know, we need to do something else about that to, to take the debate and the discussion forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, I think um, we need to engage in different spaces about this discussion about conservation. And that's so that people can, uh, people can really, um, uh, and if you can listen more, I think to me we are listening. We are not listening more. Mm -hmm. uh, to oh, we end up talking more and not listening. So to me, I think dialogue at different levels and different spaces can really help uh, bring these uh, issues uh, 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 issues uh, uh, forward. Uh, to me, I think talking and discussing in different spaces at the f team level and all these issues and uh, and also encouraging um, communities to. Uh, uh, to bring up, uh, I, I, there are a lot of people being ignored in these discussions, mm -hmm. uh, and they are, they are being kind of uh, uh, victimized. If you are against a certain narrative, instead of people making you better understand it, you get isolated. You see, which is actually you are killing the, the discussion. All right. Um, I, can I just go? Yes. Uh, I so I think your question about fundraising and attempts to support the people in the Kenyan market. So the organization I work for, we we actually highlighted that during our strategic planning process that there's a, I think 2% of our funding was coming from from local donors and trying to ask ourselves why that was, why there wasn't such a, and so we had this event, I think that early last year, we had this event where we invited all the, um, the big, you know, give us, if you will, the big business people in Nairobi. We had an event, we had a dinner, and I think more important than telling the people what you know, our organization was, and it was the one-on-one -on -one conversations trying to figure out, why don't you usually give to conservation? Like, not just us, like that's just one part of it, but why don't you, as a company, have a culture of giving? And, you know, those various, you know, um, answers to that and I think a lot of it was nobody's ever actually approached us, you know, mm -hmm. to actually give this money in a structured way. You know, it's it someone will send us a letter one time or another, but people maybe don't put in as much effort to come and see our financial committees and figure out like, you know, okay, so for this company they always give, you know, they're, 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 most companies in Kenya have this thing called C S R corporate social responsibility where they have to give some money out and you know, that like if we knew that this is something that needed funding while we were organizing CSR, 
that might be a conversation we'd be wanting to have. And after that, we actually got a few organizations and institutions that were interested in coming and funding specific you know, things that maybe align with their particular um, uh, motto or whatever. And the same thing now is, is we are really, we're realizing that can't be one of them. It has to be something that's continuous. You have to have these sorts of events, unfortunately, if we want to keep engaging that. And it's, it can't be just, you know, Lewa doing its event and, you know, then someone else doing the event. I think at some point we need to have even things like conservation fairs or something like that where we actually invite business people, we invite these funding agencies to come north and see the, you know, the Mavis, the Sarahs, the Nasulus of this world and actually um, engage with what they're supposed to be funding. I think that's a key. Yes, just on the same topic, it's something we have thought about so much. We're a 100% Kenyan organization, and 99% of our funding comes from overseas. And that really bugs us. It, we, Rasol and I battle about this all the time. And we have tried. We've gone to Kenya and saying, come on guys, fund lions, fund conservation. And one of the, I think what we're lacking in Kenya is a lot of awareness, not just of the, this, the main species that everyone talks about, rhinos, elephants, when we talk to people about the threats lions are facing, what? Lions? Since when? That's our co on our coat of arms in Kenya. It's a symbol of our country, and Kenyans don't know that those lions are about to disappear. So I think we have a huge role to play on awareness, whether it's through conservation fairs, whether it's through everyone coming together. Kenyans, step up and pay for conservation in Kenya. Pay for your own wildlife, because they are stunned when you ask them. I said, oh yeah, no, we gave to that school, so we've done conservation. That actually hasn't helped. <laughs> You've just blocked a wildlife corridor. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a huge role to play when it comes to spreading awareness and really focusing on just educating our, our country about what's going on. And it, I think, I mean, it took us two years to get one shilling from Kenyans. So it's a long process. But I think we've just got to be really committed to focusing on our own country. And it's going to take a long time.